I first wanted to talk, because we had Congressman uh, Ryan up here earlier, um, a little bit about how you see service, since you've been in public service since you were uh, in your early 20s, I believe, city council, state senate, now in the Congress. Um, that's pretty rare. Most people in their 20s are out uh, enjoying parties, and um, they're not necessarily uh, inclined to go to city council meetings. Um, so I'm curious how that come about for you and how you see that as a, a path that really kind of called you. Sure. I uh, grew up in Hawaii and was the fourth of five kids. I have three older brothers and a younger sister. Uh, the shyest, most introverted, happy to surf and read my books kid <laughs> that you would ever come across. And my friends growing up uh, would never have imagined, nor would I, that I would ever be in a position where uh, I could sit in front of a group of people like you. Uh, for me, it was just, it was about knowing and learning from a young age from our parents about the importance of living a purposeful life, that the true meaning of success and the only way that you can experience true happiness is when you dedicate your life somehow in the service of others, when you put yourself second. And I didn't know how that would apply in my life, uh, but I was out surfing one day, paddling through the ocean, seeing a bunch of trash in the water and getting very frustrated. Mm. And taking kind of the action-oriented upbringing that I had, my parents are teachers and small business owners and entrepreneurs, and you know, the, the environment that we grew up with is if you see something wrong, don't point your finger at someone else. Figure out a way to fix it bring people together to change it. So that was how I started getting very interested and passionate about protecting our environment, protecting our natural resources in Hawaii, uh, and how we started the Healthy Hawaii Coalition. And rather than, you know, we did beach cleanups. We brought different community organizations together uh, when there were things that had to be done, but we really took it a few layers deeper and said, how do we actually fix this problem? How do we get people to care so that they're not dumping their trash on the side of the road. And that's where we focused uh, our mission for the nonprofit on elementary level uh, education. So we came up with a program that we took to public schools on every island all across the state. Uh, we created a skit mm -hmm. that had the hero was Water Woman, the, uh, the bad guy was Oily Al, I was the original Water Woman. <laughs> blue cape with a beautiful glistening drop of water on the back. <laughs> uh, and we had in this skit four or five different scenes and scenarios that these kids could relate to about what happens when Oily Al is eating his chips, walking down the street and throws his trash, goes into the storm drain and where does it end up? And it was very entertaining, but you could see the light bulb go off in these kids' eyes and in their minds and they got it. And knowing that, they could take it home. And, and just understanding how we could make an impact there, which would not only affect these kids, but that they would be able to pay it forward and carry it forward. Mm -hmm. And for me personally, that's where I started to see how powerful it was to be in a position to make a difference. And what ended up eventually motivating me to um, take advantage of an opportunity to affect change within government yeah. as yeah. well. Um, great, thank you. Um, so in Silicon Valley and in the Bay Area, I mean, there's some kind of openness to politics, but politics is often viewed as not the place of innovation, not where shit happens, um, not where uh, cha world-changing ideas emerge. It's a lot of gridlock, a lot of sitting in meetings, uh, a lot of one party against another party trying to convince them that they're wrong and they're right. Um, so it's not really looked at as a, a place where it's kind of like it's a necessary evil, but it's not necessarily a place where there's a lot of energy. Um, so I'm curious how you see the political dimension and, and what avenue and importance that plays, because it seems like so much of your action beyond starting the nonprofit and some other things has also been within the political sphere. It, it has been, and I've always, you know, I've never seen... Uh... Uh, the, the political world as a so-called career path, mm -hmm. but seen it, uh, been motivated to get involved in the political process largely because of my sharing the same feeling that you're talking about, that feeling of disconnect and frustration, and nobody in these positions knows what real life is about, what real challenges people go through, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And that's what gave me that crazy idea when I was 21 to run for office. Because when I looked at those who were in office, I saw a bunch of people who had lived a different life than I would be living. Uh, they were retired and kind of sitting back and making decisions on things that were going to affect me and my future, whatever that might end up being. And they had no idea the things that I was interested in or the things that my neighbors were talking about or young families, young professionals. And understanding that for me at that point, I would make a decision to go to school and talk about political science and write and, you know, pontificate about how are we going to do this or just go for it, do my best and, and see if I could make a difference and ended up uh, winning that election at 21 in a five-way open democratic primary where when I knocked on doors, people said, <laughs> when I knocked on people's doors asking for their support, asking for the privilege and honor of, of working for them and being their voice, they said, you're too young. What are you doing? Don't you have a party to go to? <laughs> and my answer to them was, too young for what? Says who? <laughs> Do you not want fresh energy? Do you not want people representing you who have a clue about what challenges you're going through, what challenges your family are going through? Someone who'll stand here at your doorstep and ask you what you care about so that you can take those concerns and put them into, mm -hmm. into action. Mm -hmm. So recognizing that opportunity to turn that frustration around yeah. and bring it back to a focus on people and what it's all about. Mm -hmm. And that's where, you know, I, I take every opportunity to talk about servant leadership mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because to me it's such a basic, simple concept that is essential, especially in politics, but in every industry, in every line of work. and. It's such a simple concept that goes to being a leader in serving people and by doing that uplifting entire communities and changing that whole culture mm -hmm. of selfishness that mm -hmm. has pervaded leadership mm -hmm. in so many different mm -hmm. areas. Yeah, great, great. I like to pause sometimes. When I <laughs> <laughs> so you grew up with your mom um, was Hindu, a practicing Hindu, and your father Catholic. And you had just told me, I didn't know you had went to seminary. He, um, my dad did. My dad went to seminary yes. for, for a number of years. Um, what role did that play growing up? Um, and how did you, there's kind of two questions here. What role did that um, have growing up? And how did you come to the decision to take the oath on the Bhagavad Gita and the possibility that people would look at you and, and potentially judge you as somebody who was not of the faith that's traditional? And that might limit your ability to, to um, kind of get support within Congress. I, I'm glad you framed the question that way uh, in the context of a very personal practice mm -hmm. and a very personal decision, but also uh, unfortunately what drives so much of the political conversation, which is, you know, how will this affect my ability to get votes yeah. or keep the job? or what will people think about me or will they like me or not like me. Uh, I, I'm fortunate to have grown up in Hawaii, a place where uh, traditional is very different than the rest of the country. Um, Hindu, Buddhist, Christian, Catholic, atheist. I mean, Hawaii's diversity is so complete that um, we are a melting pot of cultures and religions and ethnicities that uh, my normal was very different than the yeah, normal, yeah. probably from many of you who've grown up in other parts of the country. So there was not uh, a great amount of fear. I, I grew up with a great sense of, of self-knowledge uh, and confidence mm -hmm. um, in just my own beliefs and my own practices and what that meant to me. And my own Hindu practice, my own uh, uh, looking to the Bhagavad Gita in particular, as a place of strength and inspiration and courage was very real and practical, especially as I went on my, in particular, as I went on my deployments to the Middle East, going through military training, leaving home, leaving everything that was familiar, going to the desert uh, and facing a lot of uh, personal challenges and having that strong base mm -hmm. of understanding um, that 
gave me that strength and courage to not only survive in so many ways to come home, but to come home in a way that uh, in my heart and mind, um, you know, I, I felt whole. Mm. Um, I, I, got, I brought a couple of sure, quotes sure, sure. Uh, from the Gita in particular, that in that situation, I was in a medical unit in Iraq, uh, saw and was faced with extreme injury and mm. death on a daily basis. In the camp that, that we were at, about 40 miles north of Baghdad, there was a huge sign on one of the main gates where the patrols went in and out of every day. And the big sign said in big black letters, is today the day? The big question mark. So if any one of us ever at any moment forgot about the fragility of life, uh, in that place at that time, there was that stark reminder that our time could come at any moment. And for me, I took that opportunity to reflect um, about how important it was to make sure that we make an impact, mm -hmm. that every day, every moment matters. You know, every relationship matters and placing that importance and care and respect as you're working with people, as you're dealing with people not just going through the motions mm -hmm. uh, was a wow. was a huge growth and, and learning experience for me uh, and deepened my own faith and my own mm -hmm. practice and understanding of really what's real and what mm -hmm. matters mm -hmm. there are two quotes from the Gita that I, I'd like to share with you because they helped me um, through those times and they continue to help me through uh, an environment that is not unlike <laughs> other situations that right. I've been through. <laughs> right. in, uh, in chapter 2, verse 17, in the Gita, that which pervades the entire body, you should know to be indestructible. Hmm. No one is able to destroy the imperishable soul. Hmm. The other verse is chapter 2, verse 23. The soul can never be cut into pieces by any weapon, nor can be burned by fire, nor moistened by water, nor withered by the wind. So there were days when... Wow. Thank you. Thank you. I was in my... Uh, I was in my cot in our tent. We had about, I don't know, 15 or 20 of us there. And, you know, you've got your duffel bags mm -hmm. stacked next to your cot and your sleeping bag and just going under putting my head into my sleeping bag with my flashlight and my Gita and my beads and remembering who I am wow. Wow. and in those extreme environments again what's important wow. and those experiences to go back to your question is what um, is why it was very personal but a no-brainer for me that I would mm -hmm enter this new position of great responsibility to make such a huge impact on people, not just in Hawaii, but, ev you know, everywhere, mm -hmm. uh, and take that oath on the Gita that was um, such a great source of inspiration and courage for me. Yeah, wow. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I asked you when we were in the green room, um, I think I already know the answer, but I asked her, you know, she, how old are you? Do you 31. Me? She's 31. So um, you're doing a lot. And, uh, There's you know, not much time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're taking overnight flights to land here. <laughs> um, you are, have a lot of responsibilities. And so I had asked her, like, how do you recenter? And how do you find a balance without getting caught in this kind of pace of, of constant activity such that we're doing a lot, but we're actually not bringing a lot of love, a lot of um, connection to our actions. And my experience of you is you're extremely present and, and in the moment. And I'm sure the, the Gita helps. Are there other things that you find useful in terms of um, keeping that balance? And I can only guess, and probably Congressman Ryan can attest that um, being in Congress, I, I think, has to be, in terms of patience and <laughs> non-attachment to view, yes. <laughs> has to be one of the most challenging uh, arenas in which to delve. Um, so I'm, I'm curious how that experience is going. There's, 
there, it takes active effort to accomplish that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my, my world completely changed uh, being elected a member of Congress just, just from a basic pace standpoint of, you know, you want to come and you want to tackle everything. There is yeah, so yeah. much that's broken. And so little time. <laughs> and so little time. <laughs> and you want to do it all like yesterday. Yeah. So there's a realization of like humanity yeah. that occurs. Yeah. <laughs> How many hours are in the day and focus and priority and, and, um, and understanding really and appreciating how important those daily moments mm -hmm. of solitude and practice become in order to be able to successfully tackle those many challenges. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, for me, just on, on a daily basis, both, er, you know, I, I, early in the mornings, taking those moments mm -hmm. of meditation and solitude mm -hmm. and doing my salute to the suns and <laughs> getting ready to, to uh, walk out into the cold in D.C., mm -hmm. uh, but also understanding that it, it is a constant, um, it's a constant exercise of focus and active meditation mm -hmm. uh, and remembering why we're doing what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, exercise, yeah. diet. I mean, there's there's basic things that I think we forget about when we get yeah. so deeply and passionately involved yeah. in our work. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, going home to Hawaii, I made a promise to myself to go surfing at least once every time I'm home <laughs> for district work. <laughs> that That is an incredibly therapeutic thing for me. Uh, but also just in the work that we do, being present, like... Yeah. like you're talking about and understanding the value of people and respecting and caring what they bring caring for what they bring to the to the table yeah. in every situation yeah. and that is incredibly centering mm -hmm. in and of mm -hmm. itself mm -hmm. um, yesterday I had the chance to go on Kauai to a, a boys and girls club youth of the year awards brunch Mm -hmm. There were six high school students who were in a, a program they have called Leaders in Training and competing first statewide, then regionally, then nationally. Mm -hmm. But these are kids who've, who've faced adverse, extremely adverse experiences and have not only come around, but are now paying it forward. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just, I want to mention one uh, in particular, uh, a kid who was not supposed to live past five years old. Mm -hmm. He has a hearing disability. Uh, and a speaking disability, but he stood up there in front of a hundred of us and spoke with incredible confidence about how important it is to be a servant leader, mm -hmm. how one in six high school students makes a plan for how they would commit suicide. One in six one high school One in six students. high school students, how he was one of those, one in six, and because of his community of within the Boys and Girls Club and his situation, he came through out of that, but now he has created a program, he's 16 years old, mm. to help those one in six within his greater mm -hmm. community. Wow. Stories like that, people yeah. like that, I, get, I, I have the privilege of meeting every yeah. single day yeah. who give me just so much motivation and inspiration to yeah. do the best in my job and what I can do so that they can continue to do amazing things and yeah. change our world. Yeah, yeah, great. And so it seems like that's one of the ways, that's one of the areas to focus, rather than to focus on the huge enormity of some of the challenges. Is I think it's, it, you have to recognize the enormity of the challenges, but always keep that strong connection mm -hmm. with real people because mm -hmm. it's there. Yeah. And that's the problem with, with politics. It's what frustrates me and I know so many of us is, you know, you've got the, the political rhetoric and name calling and, and finger pointing back and forth all the time. It's constant. But when you look at the substance of what's actually being discussed, oftentimes the people are forgotten in yeah. the whole conversation yeah. Yeah. about, yeah. you know, we've got these budget cuts and sequestration, all of these things that are yeah. just uh, being battled through right now. But, you know, I was going through the airport last night at one o'clock in the morning in Honolulu and one of the TSA agents stopped me and she says, how are you going to help us? Wow. I don't know how I'm going to feed my kids if I have to be forced to take a month off of work. Yeah. And, you know, there are tough decisions that have to be made, 
but understanding and keeping a hold in the, in the big picture yeah. with the reality is what's necessary. Yeah. yeah. And does some of the Gita's phrases help you hold some of that pain and suffering? Because I imagine that's very hard to hear um, and to look to you to solve a certain uh, pain, which of course you would love to solve and yet are not always able to. It is. It's, it's having a understanding which the Gita teaches so eloquently about uh, each of us fulfilling our duty and our responsibility mm -hmm. uh, and knowing that if we do our best that is all we can do mm -hmm. and leaving the end result the success or failure of whatever that project or mm -hmm. program might be um, in God's hands because yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's the best we can do <laughs> yeah. And what do you see? Do you, do you feel like you're in a huge learning kind of phase where you're like entering Congress and just going, all right, I'm just going to dive in and learn? Or is there some overriding vision of your life that, that you feel like it's, is pulling you or guiding you? Or does it feel like one thing has just led to another and it's led to another and now you have the Congress woman experience yeah. <laughs> and you'll just see what emerges from that? Yeah. Or do you feel like there's actually this, this piece that's driving you about whether it's having more young women leaders in Congress, having a different energy in Congress, or is it a whole mixture of things? I think it, for me personally, it's really uh, kind of an overarching mission of, of changing the tone of selfishness that mm. um, has taken over so much of the conversation uh, and has driven so much of what we see in what happened in Wall Street, what yeah. happened with the economic downturn, and trying to do my part uh, within Congress, mm -hmm. uh, but also with many different unique platforms, just to be able to help empower other people yeah. who are already doing amazing things, and um, seeing how seeing how I can and help inspire mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. uh, to do to do more yeah, great. Uh, to step outside of our comfort zone like I did when I was 21 right. yeah, I was scared to death knocking on those doors I was afraid of talking to strangers yeah. uh, <laughs> but being fueled by that passion and understanding that you know whether you are in business if you're in mm -hmm. business it's about not just caring about the bottom line but recognizing that you have a huge community of people that you're leading mm -hmm. and they're mm -hmm. looking to you for for guidance and looking to you for inspiration and leadership and that when you are in a position to empower them, uh, what amazing, creative, and inspiring things can come from that that none of us mm -hmm. can forecast mm -hmm. yeah. or see. Yeah, great. Uh, we don't have a lot of time left. I wanted to uh, ask you, because we're in the Bay Area, um, how do you see the technology's role? Um, I know you're, I follow you on Twitter. I don't think you follow me, because I try to say- I gotta fix that. But, you um, just busted me out. <laughs> you can't follow everybody. <laughs> um, but I've been following your, um, your tweets. Um, and a lot of people feel like it's the place for where all the change is happening, people to people, they're connecting, they're making connections. Other people feel like this is the last place we need to be spending our time because we're not talking to our neighbors anymore. We're not like really joining in community of the people around us. We're kind of spending our time in these digital worlds. Mm -hmm. um, how do you see it and how are you using it in terms of uh, kind of this larger mission or vision? So I will confess that both with Twitter and Facebook as they were starting to come out, I was one of those people who was like, that's a trend. I'm not a trend follower. I'm a trend setter. I'm not going to get involved <laughs> with all that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, started started using uh, Facebook, I don't know, a few, a few years ago, but understanding really what an incredible tool it is mm -hmm. to uh, connect with people. And, and it just always, always, always comes back to relationships. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to recognize these tools not as distractions from, you know, the relationships that we have with each other, but, you know, enhancers and, mm -hmm. and new avenues to connect with people. Uh, and that's really you know, in my campaign uh, to get elected to Congress, you know, I was 45% behind in the polls five months before our primary election. There wow. was no way I was wow. supposed to win. Yeah. Uh, my opponent was really, um, he, was, he was very confident that he had the race in the bag, but we really focused on people. We focused on reaching out, touching with and connecting with people in every possible mm -hmm. Digitally, non-digitally. Digitally, non-digitally. But using the digital to to 
provide those opportunities for the handshake mm -hmm. and the hug. Um, on Kauai, you know, very, very rural community, very small. I represent every island in the state of Hawaii, uh, including Oahu, except for the urban corridor. So I had to be very creative because mm -hmm. I couldn't be on every island all the time. But I remember posting something on Facebook about going to an Okinawan bond dance on Kauai, hmm. and uh, an elderly hmm. couple came out, <laughs> and they tracked me down at this bond dance and said, we saw you on Facebook and came here just so we could say <laughs> hi to you tonight. <laughs> it was incredible. And, then, and, and one of my favorite stories that I, I just want to share in yeah. this connection, because it, it's... Uh, it, it speaks to how social media is no longer just a young people's thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're doing all these drives during the campaign to increase the likes on Facebook and how many people are talking about us. And I went after the primary election to a, a, a meeting with a bunch of realtors. And an uh, older Japanese gentleman came up to me and he said, Tulsi, I'm 2000. <laughs> Never met him before. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh my God, am I, I, should I remember this guy? Like, 2000 it, what? It took, me, it took me about two and a half seconds, and I said, you were my 2000th like on Facebook. <laughs> and he said, yes. Wow. And on Facebook, I remembered <laughs> typing out, Gerald, thanks for being my 2000th like on Facebook. <laughs> So we took a picture together, you know, he wrote 2000 on his business card and that meant the world to him yeah, yeah. because that was our little special connection that nobody else has. Yeah. And that's the yeah. incredible value yeah, that cool. I see of social media. That's cool. So when, uh, when I met, we just met right before this and when you came out of the car and you're on your way, I think I, which is, I don't usually put out my hand to handshake, but you just went up and hugged me. <laughs> And I was like, oh, you're a hugger. And she's like, yeah, I, I, sorry, sorry, I forgot to warn you. <laughs> and I was like, no, it's fine. I'm totally down with that. I just didn't know. Um, this is Hawaii. <laughs> That's what we do there. <laughs> um, has that naturally been your, has that kind of just been a part of, and I think you come across that people would probably feel hugged by you right now. I um, hope so. <laughs> has that just been naturally your kind of way of being in the world? Yeah, I think it's uh, coming from Hawaii where aloha is a way of yeah. life. And for those of you who visited Hawaii, um, you know that there are a special kind of people there yeah. with a special feeling of warmth and aloha, uh, not only for each other, but for visitors. And, uh, you know, the true meaning of aloha and when someone... Um, it's respect, it's love, it's compassion, mm -hmm. but it is the sharing of breath. Ha means breath. Uh. And when you understand the meaning of, you know, words and just things that we go through the motions, again, yeah. it's just recognizing the meaning and, and acting with purpose. Yeah. Yeah. So when you say aloha to someone, it's not just like, hey, what's up, brah? Right. <laughs> <laughs> There's actually meaning there. And... It goes back to how we started this conversation about yeah. being present yeah. in all that we do and not seeing uh, these different tools or different things as distractors or people right. as distractors, but recognizing the value of everyone, yeah. whether it be a friend mm -hmm. or it be someone in the political world who's on the far opposite side mm -hmm. of any political conversation but treating people with respect and yeah. recognizing the magic that can happen when you do that. Yeah, wow, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So thanks for Tulsi for bringing thank her you. aloha here. Thank you very much. Thank you.